So we have another early medical school student here to join us to talk about his path um, in going to medical school. Matt Nettles is here to join us um, and I will let him take it away. Matt, I saw you log in a second ago, so I know. I, yeah, I'm here. Can everyone hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay, great, great. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, it's great to be with you all today. Um, again, my name is Matt Nettles and I'm finishing up my second year of medical school here at Vanderbilt. Um, actually, today is my last clinical day. Um, and uh, so that's exciting. And I'll tell you that um, that I made it to medical okay. school. Yeah, go ahead. Can I, sorry to yeah. interrupt. I'm not sure if you want to have your, your camera on or not. You're welcome to oh. do whatever, but we can't see you. Sure. Just, I didn't okay. know if you needed it. Yeah. All right. What about now? look great awesome <laughs> okay sorry let me see for some reason i can't see anybody but uh okay if you can see me we'll, we'll go with that perfect great thank you so okay. much sure sure um so a bit about me i grew up in a small suburb of southern california um and as far as i'm concerned my parents are some of the highest achievers that i know considering where they came from and considering what they were able to provide for me and my siblings um, my father was a probation officer. He recently uh, retired actually. And my mom shifted between homemaking and caring for and teaching children. And um, I'll tell you all that to really say that like moral development was prioritized over intellectual achievement in my home growing up. And on balance, uh, I'm grateful for that. It kept me out of the, um, the kind of trouble that many of my boys growing up weren't able to uh, avoid quite frankly. Um, but I had limited expectations for myself academically. Um, after high school, I took classes at uh, our local community college, but I found that I preferred working full time. So I put more focus on work and <laughs> frankly did just enough uh, not to fail classes. Um, but after a year of that, I found myself uh, quite restless with life. Um, and I had always been drawn to service, and um, I, I thought I might follow my uh, my father into law enforcement. Um, but really, I was you know I was really growing impatient, and so instead, I decided um, it was time for for a change. And so I enlisted in the military, and um, that decision, I'm sure, changed the trajectory of my life. Uh, in the military, I found um, an environment. Uh, that I found the environment I needed to unlock uh, whatever potential I had. Um, so I served for four years in the Air Force. Um, and at the end of, the end of that time, I had developed enough self-confidence and um, ambition, frankly, to push myself to serve uh, in what I saw as a greater capacity. Um, and I decided I would need to further my education to achieve that goal. Um, and I was ready to take that seriously. Um, and by then I was married and my wife supported me in, in, in that pursuit, even though we were expecting our first daughter. And so um, I'm forever in, forever in her debt for that. Uh, but I wasn't sure what I would study or uh, precisely how I wanted to serve, um, but uh, I got lucky. So when you separate from the military, you have what they call um, an exit physical which is you know, kind of like a checkbox check box thing, um, but it can be important for folks who suffer uh, serious physical and emotional trauma during their service. Um, I was lucky on both of those counts. So um, my physical was uneventful, um, except that it completely changed my life. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't remember the name of the doctor. Uh, I can't even remember what he looks like at this point, but he asked me what I planned to do and I sort of explained my plan and he asked, have you ever considered medicine? Um, and while I, I knew this was a job that people did, um, but I never thought of myself in that way. It's, uh, it's not that I believed the opportunity was foreclosed to me. Um, I never even thought of it as an opportunity, really. Um, I was 24 at that point, so much older than, than most of you or all of you, I'm sure. Um, and at that point, I uh, had never actually met a black doctor. Um, I don't even remember what my reply to his question was, but his question prompted me to explore medicine as a possibility um, for someone who looks 
like me. Uh, and here I am. Um, so I came to STEM through the back door, you could say. Um, I was interested in serving people. And, and I realized that STEM is a unique toolbox. And it's, um, it's a really useful one if one is interested in the reduction of suffering, um, as I am and I'm sure many of you are. Um, so I went to the University of Arizona, studied neuroscience and cognitive science there. Um, I, I thought and I still think the brain is the most interesting object in the universe. Um, um, and of course, I quickly, you know, adopted the overachieving posture of a pre-med student. I did research in an effective neuroscience lab. I volunteered. I shadowed lots of um, different doctors. Um, and because I was married with a child and we needed some money, uh, I got a um, work study position as a tutor at the University Veterans Center. Um, and um, again, a, a lot of that seems like box checking. I'm sure some of you have looked at the requirements for getting into med school and, and you notice a lot of that, you know, checks those boxes of what they're looking for. And there's some of that. Um, but there are so many opportunities that I was able um, really to avoid doing anything solely to check boxes. Um, I was able to do things because they interested me, interested me, um, or um, because they allowed me to uh, help out populations that were either underserved um, or that I felt like I was uniquely situated to help in some way. Um, and that's always been important for me, kind of um, reconciling the work I'm doing in the world with my core principles. Um, and I suppose that goes back to the environment I grew up in. Um, my parents talked openly about values and uh, their expectations were quite clear. Um, and so uh, happily now my wife and I are taking up that project in our own on home with our two girls. Um, and I have an eye toward that as I'm uh, thinking about what I want my professional life to be like. Um, and even as I make decisions, moving into the immersion phase of the Vanderbilt curriculum, which gives us more uh, latitude and the opportunities that we pursue. Um, of course, I wanna learn more about the science of medicine. Um, um, because I, you know, I love medicine because it uses the indispensable tools of science, but at, bottom, it's a human practice. Um, that's what I really love about it. Um, that's all I have about sort of me. I don't know if I should move into the professional story or how you guys are doing this. Yeah, I think we'd love to hear more about um, your professional story. That sounds great. We uh, recently I had a, a two week elective um, and the emergency department here. Um, and this was a somewhat sluggish night in the ED. Um, but then a young woman rolled into the trauma bay. Um, she had been in a car accident. Um, she was belligerent. Um, she was you know, wiry, but quite strong, even in handcuffs. Um, she was brought in by police officers and clearly under the influence of something. Um, but despite the chaos and her belligerent, the emergency medicine uh, docs and trauma surgeons and all the team members really performed admirably. Um, they ran all their algorithms gracefully, as far as I could tell. Um, and uh, they did all of this, um, even as she peppered them with insults. Um, she didn't want to be touched, and she wasn't shy about letting us know that. Um, and she, she called members of the team names that I won't repeat in, in polite company. Um, uh, she really got upset when they had to, you know, put off her work shirt and bra to inspect her more fully, which is sort of um, standard operating procedure in the ED, um, because they were they were both new, and uh, so she was upset about that, and she uh, sharpened her criticisms of us. Um, let's say she really only settled down after um, several sedative medications were administered in, in a stepwise fashion, um, but she did settle down finally. The team did their work. And things turned out all right um, for her in the end, at least um, medically speaking. Um, but at different points following that encounter that we had, um, both the resident and the attending physician on the team, you know, individually came up and apologized to me. And you know, they assured me that you know this was an unusual night. Um, you'll, if you go into med school, you'll find that as you're going through your clinical rotations, folks are trying to sell you on their specialty. 
And so they told me, um, uh, this is this is unusual, this mix of low activity and then you know lots of bizarre activity, but you know, no real emergency as they saw it. Um, and they assured me that there usually were real traumas and real emergencies and um, and I appreciated all of that. And of course I knew what they meant. Um, but the truth is watching them in action, I thought that um, they were practicing medicine at its very best. Um, caring for people who are difficult to care for, I think is um, medicine at its best. They, um, they remained professional, um, but that's really, that's too sterile a description for what I saw. Um, they, they were compassionate to her, like truly concerned with her well-being um, even as she was making their job much harder than it really needed to be. Um, of course, they weren't happy that she was being so difficult. Um, they raised their eyebrows and they um, exchanged glances and, and, and muttered underneath their breath and all of that. Um, but the care she received never, never suffered, um, neither technically nor humanistically. Um, and uh, I was just really impressed with that. Um, and it got me thinking, that you know, throughout um, our second year, which again is our um, clinical year, our first full clinical year, um, I have been given, and I'm sure uh, most of my classmates have been given the advice to find our people, some variation of that advice at least. Um, and um, I don't disagree with the wisdom of that approach. Um, I think you know, finding an environment that allows you to be who you are as fully as possible um, is important to do. Um, but this particular experience helped me to realize that that advice, that, that advice is um, incomplete. I think it uh, misses something important about humans um, that we just we don't just aim to be happy. We also aim to be particular kinds of people. Um, so I think it's uh, just as important to think about the environment in which the environments in which we're happy as it is the environments in which we feel like kind of productive pressure to be better um, and it's just as important I believe to find our people as it is to find the people we hope to be like um, some of the I think some of the most consequential decisions we make is to place ourselves in particular environments um, the military for me was a formative experience it's highly unlikely that I would be at an institution like Vanderbilt um, speaking with you all if I had not placed myself in that kind of environment um, um, and when I think back, uh, I realize I did it because I um, respected the kind of people who served and I wanted to be more like them. And I'm not sure I would have said it in those words back then when I joined, but I think that's what, um, what I was attracted to. Um, and I'm sure that many of you are pursuing science because, um, because you think it's cool, of course, um, but also... Um, maybe you find something admirable in the role of a scientist um, as truth seeker or knowledge producer or whatever. And this case compelled me to keep that insight um, central as I continue to think through what my life in medicine will look like. And um, I should say, you know, this approach has all the, all the limitations of one that requires overgeneralization. Um, uh, and that way has a, has similar problems to the find your piece people approach it sort of flattens um, the diversity inherent inherent in every specialty of medicine or uh, field of inquiry more broadly. Um, and I, I think it's important to point out the limitations of every model that we use. But I, I believe that it's um, that trying to find the people we admire has the advantage of orienting us toward growth um, rather than stasis as you know as medical students deciding on specialties, and perhaps as uh, young scientists deciding on a particular field of interest. Um, but that's all I got. Um, thanks for your attention. Oh, what fantastic advice. That is fabulous. Um, I will open it up to questions. So if you want to raise your hand, I can uh, call you by in order. Or if you want to chat your question in the chat box, I'm happy to read it out. We have Jillian who raised her hand. Um, so take it away. Hello, I just want to say thank you for both of you who have presented. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, during this program, I have not heard your full story, but I have heard like 
that you were from the Navy several times. I have heard, so it's nice to put a face to the person. <laughs> Matthew, they have mentioned you very much. They do love you here. Um, but so my thing is that your story about the ER, um, I was just wondering, I guess, Vanderbilt, but like, I like that the fact that they helped the patient and they were very uh, much worried about the patient's health and not looking at the patient as themselves, but looking at the patient as in someone who needs help. Um, so then I was just wondering, like, is Vanderbilt, how is Vanderbilt with that? Because I know that sometimes like prejudice does come into the ER and it does play into a role in whenever taking care of patients. So like, is there um, something that Vanderbilt has in play in the medical program that helps you um, work against those prejudices? Or that doesn't a word, prejudice. <laughs> Sure, and that's, um, um, first of all, thanks for the question. Um, it's good to meet you, Jillian. Um, um, that's such a good question. It's hard to answer it, to do it justice here in this kind of a format, but um, I'll say that Vanderbilt really does, as far as I can tell, you know, I've been here a couple of years now and um, they seem to, to, to care deeply about um, treating people um, fairly, justly, and um, being honest about the biases that we have as individuals, um, which is, you know, it comes with the whole being human package. Um, and then also the ones that, that, that um, we are often blind to because they sort of arise out of these complex systems that we build. Um, and uh, Vanderbilt does seem um, to to care deeply about those things. We, we have, I don't know if you guys have heard about sort of the learning communities exp experiences that we have, which are part of our medical education, but it's where we're sort of pulled out of the, both the classroom and the clinical environment. Um, we're with, with you know, groups of our peers longitudinally and we're with faculty mentor. And we talk about some of these issues. We talk about bias in medicine um, and even more broadly, just sort of in society. And uh, a lot of that uh, has to come through with, with just, with better and better conversations. And so we, we really do that here. We try to have conversations to uncover biases by having people who have diverse life experiences um, and, uh, and come together to, to talk things out and, and try to uncover those things. And then we can take that into the clinics and, and put that into context um, and I think that's you know true not just at the medical student level. I think, I think more and more that's happening with residents and even among faculty. Um, and where Vanderbilt ranks among other you know like sort of its peer academic institutions, I can't say because I'm only here. Um, but it seems to be something that that um, um, people are increasingly interested in, which I think is a is a good thing. I hope I'm sorry that was an inadequate inadequate uh, answer to your question. It was a very good question. Great, thank you. Um, Preston has our next question. Hi, Matthew. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. I might have that, so I thought I'd check. Um, so one thing I'm curious about, because you talked about a, a lot of your experiences, it seemed like it was something very personally meaningful and motivating for you. Um, so I guess as far as pre-med and applying to medical school goes, how does that compare or is, how is that viewed differently versus, I don't know, maybe people that have thousands and hundreds of thousands of hours and X amount of activities or this like name brand type internship or type thing. How is that viewed differently um, to medical schools and how might we like convey that difference when we're applying? Does that question make sense? Um, I, I'm, I just want to be sure that I understand what you're saying. Are you are you yeah. saying like because my background is sort of different than the typical like pre medical student? It just seems like your background was motivated rather than like by being attractive or name brand or ten thousand hours in something. It was something that was personally meaningful to you and you were drawn to. Um, so how did you like convey that? I guess to medical schools. Yeah, um, I think I think. Um, I think, uh, and this is actually something Leanne was was really um, uh, talking um, eloquently about uh, right as I came on. Um, one thing that people I think people miss as they're applying to medical school 
is the power of stories. And um, that's really what people want to hear. They actually want to hear that passion, whatever it is, you know, it doesn't matter it, it, if you went to a top, you know, Ivy League school or whatever, great. Um, if you went to a, a good public school like me, um, public research university, then, then great. Um, but, you know, what is it that you did there? What did you learn? What are you bringing um, into medicine with you? Um, really being able to tell a compelling story about that is important. And if you, um, you know, you could probably fake it well enough, but if you really are passionate and you have something, you have like a real story to tell, um, then that's like, that's a huge asset when you're feeling, you're, you're going to be writing personal statements and, and all of these secondaries um, for your various applications. Um, being able to tell those stories and tell them um, in a compelling way is really, really important. So I, I really think in many ways it was advantage, an advantage to come in um, the way I did from the military with a family, um, thinking more about the reduction of suffering and values and all that kind of stuff. And still, you know, being excited about, you know, I was a science major and um, uh, again, I, I really, I think the tools of, of science are perhaps the best ones for addressing questions of suffering. Um, so packaging all of that into a compelling story to tell is um, really valuable. Thank you, that helps. All right. Oh, good. We have another question. Take it away, Vilma. Hi there. Um, so firstly, thank you so much for sharing that story. That was really inspiring. Um, I have a question about like what made you choose Vanderbilt to apply to? Or could you talk a little bit more about your process of kind of, you know, um, comparing between different medical school programs and what drew you to across the country. I'm from Arizona myself, so um, I was like, wow, you're, you're in Tennessee now. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, um, it's, you know, it's, it's a good question, but it's a deeply personal one in that um, um, everyone's going to have different factors. I mean, a lot of there's going to be a lot of overlap with the factors that you're thinking about. Um, but you're going to give them a different weight depending on where you are in your life and, and what you value most. Um, and so that's kind of the, the broad answer. And then personally for me, so I was married, I had a kid at the time. And so like that matters a lot, um, you know, uh, and then also I was in the military. And so I, I probably don't have the sort of attachments to home that many of you probably still have um, or attachments to, you know, wherever you went to college. Um, so I actually picked like the University of Arizona because it was like close enough to home, which California again is where I'm from. Me and my wife are both from California. And so it was like close enough that we could like drive for a few hours and be home. But it was like far enough to where we can like establish ourselves like um, as a fan, our own like family unit. And then also like it's much less expensive, right? So like those were the factors that, that um, uh, that caused, caused me to pick uh, Arizona. And then also like th they had a great veteran center and I thought it would be like hard for me to transition from the military to college. Um, so like that helped having that strong veteran center there. And so like, those are the kind of factors I was thinking about. And then, so with medical school, again, geography, I didn't weigh as much as some of you might weigh it. And that's, that's completely fair. Um, we're gonna all have a, sort of a different calculus as we're making these decisions. So geography wasn't a big deal to me. Um, you know, I really, for me, it was, I wanted to go to a good school. I wanted to, to be able to, to know that, like, we could find a place to live that was conducive to um, raising my family. So I was, like, starting to look at schools and stuff like that um, around the neighborhoods. And just I wanted my wife to, um, to be happy where we were. Um, also, uh, it's quite expensive. So I wanted to receive a scholarship if I could. Um, and honestly, like, we just kind of sat down and... Um, Vanderbilt checked uh, every box and uh, it came down to a, a couple of schools and we decided on Vanderbilt. Fantastic. We have a couple more minutes if anybody has any other questions, but other than that, we can um, respect our presenters' times, both very wonderful and inspiring stories, both from Leanne and Matt. So thank you so much. Um, I don't see anyone else asking a question or raising their hand. So I think we'll wrap it up. 
Those were fantastic. Thank you both so much for joining us. And personally, for me, it's really nice to be able to hear stories um, of medical students. So I appreciate it so much. Uh, someone in the chat like asked, I think, uh, for uh, contact info, um, I'll like, message me privately. Um, but I'll just put it in the chat. Yeah, I do think Leanne put her information in too. So that way, if anybody has any questions, um, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, here, let me. Feel sorry. free to reach out to any of us. I think that's one really great thing I've loved about Vanderbilt is just the culture that everyone, like we're all here to help each other. It's a very teaching focused institution. And so it's honestly one of the things that made me come to Vanderbilt is just how much, you know, they prioritize their students. And so like, we really mean it when we say like reach out, we know like we've been through the same exact things you have been, we've had to make the decisions that you guys will have to make. And so it's just so helpful to have someone just a few steps forward from you. Absolutely true. Very good. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Beth will be back next week. So you can deal with somebody who knows what they're talking about next week. Um, but thank you both Matt um, and Leanne and all of our um, audience for attending uh, and have a fantastic day. Bye everyone. Check out our website to find recordings of all of our videos. We'll get them posted about a week after each of the presentations. We can't wait to see you.